I wanted to just thank you for having me give these talks here at the Mexican Retina Society meeting. I really hope someday that I can actually come to this meeting live and in person and give talks like this to you. Uh, but for the time being, because of COVID, I really just appreciate the opportunity to be able to give these different talks. So the first talk that I'm going to be giving is the top five pearls from the DRCR clinical trials. And you'll find that the DRCR pearls are deeper than just five separate pearls. So this actually is probably going to be more like 15 pearls. These are my disclosures. And most importantly, what I want to say is, is that uh, I'm a participant in the DRCR network, and these are just my observations based off my experience over the last 15 years in the DRCR. But I am in no way speaking on behalf of the DRCR. And really, we're going to focus on three main things, all of which are going to help hopefully contribute to the way you manage patients clinically. The first is going to be the role of, manage, of pharmacotherapy in the management of diabetic macular edema. And then it, towards the last 20% uh, of the talk, we're going to be talking about the use of anti-VEGF therapy on diabetic retinopathy. So just a little bit about the Diabetic Retinopathy Clinical Research Network, or the DRCR. This is a group of, uh, of practices across the United States and even in Canada that are looking at clinically important questions in regards to diabetic retinopathy. So basically, this is our generation's version of the ETDRS or the DRS. And so we have private practices, we have academic institutions, we have a variety of different places that are contributing to the DRCR involving over a thousand investigators. And so it really can have very meaningful and impactful uh, answers to questions. We are here in Lexington, Kentucky. And these are all of the different studies that the DRCR has participated in up through December of 2018. And they sequentially order their studies by letters. So the DRCR A study, B study, C study, and so on. And we're all the way down actually now to like W and we're starting to do double letters. So the AA study and whatnot. Also, you have access to all of the slides I'm going to be showing you. The DRCR is very good about publishing online their presentations. And so I would encourage you to go online to the drcr.net. You don't have to be a member of the DRCR network to access these publications, and you can view and download the pre presentations. So let's get on with these pearls. I think the first pearl is relatively evident to everyone, but it is that anti-VEGF therapy is the gold standard for diabetic macular edema. And we know this courtesy of the DRCR protocol I study, which compared laser to ranibizumab with either prompt or deferred laser, and compared that to triamcinolone plus prompt laser. We had great follow through on these studies. And here we can see the overall outcome at one and two years. And the top two lines, which showed a significant improvement in visual acuity that was sustained, are both the ranibizumab groups, prompt and deferred laser. The yellow graph is actually triamcinolone plus prompt laser, and the purple graph is actually the laser treatment group alone. And so this really, for the first time, established that uh, anti-VEGF therapy was the gold standard for the treatment of diabetic macular edema. And when we actually looked at different factors, other factors really didn't play a role. So if you look at the baseline visual acuity, both patients with good visual acuity and poor visual acuity, anti-VEGF therapy was the gold standard. When you look at patients who had a thicker OCT versus a thinner OCT, once again, we saw anti-VEGF therapy was better than triamcinolone and prompt laser or a laser alone. When we look at uh, change in visual acuity or prior diabetic macular edema treatment, those patients who had been had prior treatment, they did just as well uh, as the patients who had uh, no treatment or were treatment naive. When you look at the type of macular edema, focal edema versus diffuse edema uh, versus neither, you can see anti-VEGF therapy did well across the board. And I'll point out particularly here focal uh, edema. I remember back before the data of this study was known, we used to treat 
focal edema with focal laser treatment, and then more diffuse edema with trimcinolone or anti-VEGF therapy. A patient's level of retinopathy really didn't discern whether or not they responded better to anti-VEGF therapy versus other therapies. So once again, the blue and the orange lines being anti-VEGF therapy did better than everything else. There was one exception, however, and that exception was in pseudophagic patients. And so when you look at the pseudophagic patients, actually, we can see that triamcinolone and prompt laser treatment actually did do as well as anti-VEGF therapy. We will come back to this in just a bit, so hold that thought. We also saw that anti-VEGF therapy had a really long-lasting effect on DME in a positive way. So these visual acuity improvements that we saw at one and two years were maintained throughout five years of the study. And what's very interesting is, is that the number of injections actually went down over that study. So in other words, in the first year, patients on average would receive uh, eight or nine injections in the ranibizumab treatment groups. The second year, it'd be five or six. The third year, it'd be three or four. And by years four and five, it was just one or two injections given. And so there is something about anti-VEGF therapy in the setting of DME that for the average patient actually shows a significant change in the way their retinopathy responds and their diabetic macular edema responds to treatment. The second pearl is, is that there does appear to be a difference between anti-VEGF therapies. Years after the protocol I study, we now had three FDA approved treatments for diabetic macular edema. And this led the DRCR network to study the, and compare these three treatments in the DRCR protocol T study, where we compared two milligrams of vitriol of flibercept versus 1.25 milligrams of intravitreal bevacizumab and 0.3 milligrams of intravitreal ranibizumab. Now, I know for those of you who are international, the 0.3 milligram dose of intravitreal ranibizumab is actually different than what we see outside the U.S. In the U.S., 0.3 is the FDA-approved treatment for diabetic macular edema. Everywhere else, it's the 0.5 milligram dose. Now, when you compare the statistics in this study to the outcomes in the protocol I study where the 0.5 milligram dose was used, uh, you can see that they are very similar. So I think we can extrapolate the 0.5 and 0.3 being fairly equivalent. That holds true also for the Ride and Rise studies where they compared 0.3 and 0.5. Very equally matched baseline characteristics, including prior treatments for anti, with anti-VEGF therapy. When we look at the entire study population, we can see that there is a slight improvement with aflibercept compared to ranibizumab and bevacizumab. When we see OCT, similarly, we see a greater drying effect with aflibercept versus ranibizumab and bevacizumab. But when you break these study populations out, to those patients who were 20, 50 or worse compared to the patients with good visual acuity, we can see that aflibercept actually does better, almost a line better compared to ranibizumab at one year, and almost two lines of visual acuity better compared to bevacizumab. And this has actually led to insurance companies in the United States allowing us to use aflibercept sooner in these patients with worse visual acuity. And the OCT differences are actually greater in those patients that are 20, 50 or worse as far as the drying effect is concerned. Now, I would be remiss if I did not point out the fact that there is a big cost difference. And here we can see the differences in cost between aflibercept, bevacizumab, and ranibizumab in the protocol T study. Now, steroids may still have a role in managing diabetic macular edema. You will remember this from the protocol I study, as I pointed out earlier, that there actually was a good equivalence when comparing ranibizumab with prompt or deferred laser to triamcinolone and prompt laser in pseudophagic patients. And when we simply stratify out the pseudophagic patients, we can actually see that the yellow line now approximates what we see in the patients that were treated with anti-VEGF therapy. 
And the reason is, is because those patients treated with triamcinolone and prompt laser develop cataracts if they were phacic. And that led to decreased visual acuity at one year and two years. So if we have pseudophagic patients at baseline, steroids seem to be of similar efficacy. But with far fewer treatments, and here we can see the median number of injections during year one and two, and where we're giving nine or 10 injections in protocol I of anti-VEGF therapy in year one, it's only three of triamcinolone plus laser. When we look at the protocol T study, we can see that there are a fair number of patients that have persistent diabetic macular edema with reduced vision. And this includes patients treated with Flibercept, Bevacizumab, and Ranibizumab. Now the DRCR actually looked at combining Ranibizumab with the Dexamethasone or Ozurdex implant in a study called the DRCR Protocol U study. And in the Protocol U study, they compared patients who were run in with Ranibizumab and then randomized to either quarterly injections or every three month injections of Ozurdex versus, um, and Ranibizumab versus Ranibizumab alone. We really didn't see any significant difference in patients' visual acuity outcomes as it pertains to the entire group. But the pseudophagic patients, again, in the combination group treated with dexamethasone and ranibizumab, actually showed a pretty significant difference, whereas the phagic patients, who might well have developed a cataract during those first six months, actually showed a difference in favor of ranibizumab. But when we look at OCTs, we can see that there is a greater drying effect in the combination treatment group of about 50 microns. And so this is fairly significant. So for those patients who have significant uh, persistent edema, there may still be a role for steroids. Although steroids have side effects, and we can see these mainly uh, cataracts and elevated intraocular pressure. This once again points to the fact that fewer uh, anti-VEGF injections are needed over time. So perhaps as we go on and on with therapy, we actually may not require as many injections. And so this may also play a role in determining what you want to use. So what about those non-responders? Maybe they don't need steroids. As I just showed, fewer injections over time, but there are still a fair number of patients who have persistent edema. Now, on the order of about 40% of patients in the protocol I study that were treated with ranibizumab still had center-involved edema through their six-month visit. How did these patients do over time? Well, we can see that there are still a fair number, 40% after three years of therapy, that will have persistent edema. But those patients with persistent edema don't do so poorly. We can see 2025 if they have uh, no persistent edema and 2032 on average at year three if they have persistent edema but they are at a greater risk of vision loss. And we can see here that there is by year two and three, a pretty significant amount uh, compared to the, uh, the patients that do not have persistent edema. However, still well less than 20%. And this persistent edema story holds true across the board with all anti-VEGF therapies. So we can see that there are patients who have persistent edema out to six months when treated with a flibercept, bevacizumab, or ranibizumab. But if you stick with it, many of these patients with persistent edema will actually have significant visual acuity gains through year two. What about the patient with good vision and diabetic macular edema? Well, if you look at those patients, and we did in the protocol V study, these are patients with good visual acuity, we can see that there is a lower likelihood of these patients uh, having a significant vision loss at two years in all the groups. So, how do we judge this? Well, first of all, you can say you can do nothing. And if you look here at the patients who had observation, many of these patients did very well with 74% of the patients treated with laser and 63% of the patients treated uh, with observation or, or only observed actually had pers uh, did not need any treatments throughout the uh, two years of the study. Or you could say inject. If you look at inject, you can say that the chances of you having 20-20 or better vision at two years is actually greater in those patients treated with the flibercept. But there is a cost, and that cost is about eight injections over those two years on average. And finally, you could say, look, I like to laser, and laser shows that there is a decreased need for treatment over those first two years if you do focal laser treatment in the setting of diabetic macular edema.
Finally, as we kind of come to a close here, the role of anti-VEGF therapy in diabetic retinopathy is really being expounded upon over the last couple of years. We know that anti-VEGF therapy is effective in uh, proliferative diabetic retinopathy. This is from the Protocol S study, which compared anti-VEGF therapy to PRP laser treatment. And we can see significantly lower numbers of vitrectomy in the patients treated with anti-VEGF therapy versus uh, laser treatment and lower rates of other complications associated with this even out to five years where the uh, amount of vitrectomies performed was about half in the anti-VEGF group versus PDR. However, there's a cost and that cost is injections, 20 injections over five years versus 5.4 in the PRP group. But with this anti-VEGF therapy, we see a significant improvement in diabetic retinopathy, upwards of about 50% in the protocol S study had a two-step improvement in retinopathy severity score. In addition, we see visual acuity improvements in these patients, even the patients without diabetic macular edema, we can still see a significant improvement. And for those patients with diabetic macular edema, we see even greater improvements. And the anti-VEGF therapy actually reduces the occurrence of diabetic macular edema. Importantly, Anti-VEGF therapy does not cause traction to progress, which is really important in treating these patients who might have early traction. So there's a lower chance of needing to go to surgery uh, with what we consider the crunch phenomenon that used to happen uh, compared to previous. And there's less visual field loss with anti-VEGF therapy over the first two years. But interestingly, as we go out to five years, we can see that there is some peripheral visual field loss, even in patients who are treated only with anti-VEGF therapy. And this indicates that the ischemia still progresses. Now, what anti-VEGF therapy does not appear to do is it doesn't appear to clear vitreous hemorrhage. And the protocol in study compared a saline injection to a ranibizumab injection. And you can see the probability of going on to need vitrectomy is about the same between the two groups in the early follow-up and the late follow-up periods. So we can safely say that it looks like anti-VEGF therapy doesn't help to clear vitreous hemorrhage, but what it does do is reduce the recurrence of vitreous hemorrhage. Finally, in the Protocol S study, we do have some indication that pattern laser treatment may not be as effective as what we see with single spot PRP. And we can see that uh, actually there were more patients that actually went on to develop uh, proliferative disease in these pay are worsening PDR in these patients treated with proliferative disease. And this actually led the DRCR to make a statement uh, that pattern laser may not be as effective. So in summary, the big pearls to take home from this talk is that anti-VEGF therapy is the standard of care for DME. The number of injections do tend to decrease over time. There is an efficacy difference in anti-VEGF therapies for patients with lower vision. And there's a large cost difference between these therapies. Using anti-VEGF therapy for DME is effective even in under-responsive therapies, if you under-responsive patients if you stick with it. And steroids still may have a role in those pseudophagic patients. And that anti-VEGF therapy is not inferior to PD, PRP and PDR. Thank you again. And I apologize for going over just a bit. I appreciate you having me. And everyone stay healthy.